Um, so we're going to be very quick, uh, as quick as possible, about a topic which is uh, not as difficult as the one that was presented by the Professor Blythe earlier. But I'm sure it's a topic with which, um, a topic which you will encounter potentially on a daily basis in your development slash applications security life. Um, it's a continuation of a presentation uh, three years ago at WASC um, and basically it's a it's sort of an update if you wish that presentation so if we look back uh, two years ago uh, you'll see that. Um, I have so I'm doing application security but I have two, two guys with me which are the proper developers security champions at Sage. Doing Java unfortunately so we'll be out of the job soon. <laughs> Um, and because we want to be quick, let's go to the next slide. So on this slide, I just want to ask that the picture on the, on the left, how many of you recognize yourselves in that? Can you lift your hand? One, two, three, four, five at most. Okay. Right. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll explain later what I meant by it. And how many people recognize themselves in the, the picture on the right. One. One. Okay. Top of the All right. Very tough. Okay. So that means most of you have identified your ideal security tool and uh, or set of tools. And most of you uh, do not run tests manually, you have automated your entire pipeline and everybody's happy. Great. Okay. <laughs> Right, so um, I, I want to explain a bit um, what are the pain points uh, behind uh, vulnerability management and, and uh, security testing automation. It's the same problem in 2018, and that is where is the data? Where does it come from? So there's so many tools, so many sources. You have internal testing, external testing, tools that do dynamic analysis, static analysis, dependency checking container scanning, all sorts of tools. Um, what is the risk? So I think somebody was mentioning earlier that uh, a good idea would be for someone to go to business and say, well, accept this risk. But do you know what that is? Is it, is it clear? Um, a security gates, where, where does security come in into this pipeline? How do you ensure that of security has either their blessing or whatever you want to call it. Um, tools, again I mentioned there's lots of tools, they are easily forgotten and abandoned. So if you search for security tools on the internet, I have a few links about those um, on other slides. There's, there's literally hundreds. Uh, some of them you don't know what's happening with them, they're forgotten, abandoned, whatever. Um, and lastly, um, products, product management. Do they care about security? Yeah, they care about the availability, they care about their features. If security can do anything good about that, then, then they'll care about hearing your, your story. Otherwise, no. So that's kind of the security and point pain points, and now I'm going to leave it to Nicholas for the developer. Yeah. Uh, so from, from a dev perspective, right? We we just want to, to build uh, a feature based on some requirements we receive. And we build everything, if we test everything, we're happy with what we've built, we're ready to ship. And then all of a sudden, poof, magic. Security stories. And then you have like a new backlog of 15, 20 stories that you have to go through. Um, and we, 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 most of the people there were not even aware that this this is a thing, you know, we have to go through these things. We, we all thought we were ready to ship next week. Um, and then, okay, once you crunch through that full bucket of stories, uh, then you get to the point of, okay, now we have to release this thing. So someone needs to, to sign it off, or we have to run a set of tests or scans or something that says, okay, now it's good for someone to sign it off. And this is all kind of frustrating for, for a developer. And then that leads to the, the tools that Lucian mentioned. There's like 
hundreds of tools of them. Which tools do we use? Uh, there's in, in our company, we're using, I don't know, at least 15 tools. I'm not sure if I know half of them. Uh, and that means you have to go through each and every one of them, run whatever they do, uh, evaluate the report, see if you have any actions for you as a developer to, to remediate vulnerabilities or threats or whatever, and then do the same process again and again. And then in the end, are we ever secure enough? Uh, I don't know. Probably not. Right, so we, we mentioned lots of tools. Uh, this slide is going to be quick. Uh, we're going to share the slides so there's some links for you to uh, enjoy um, and, and eventually hopefully determine what tool is best for you. Um, it's, it's arguably, it's, argue, it's, an, it's a big argument this, it's kind of the, the type of what, what programming languages do I, uh, do I use, what type of software do I use, what is the, the business logic, what is the perfect uh, security tool in my context. So that's why I guess you, you, you need to hire people that understand these tools and are able to apply the right tool to your context. Uh, but even with that in mind, there are, there's the issue that, I, that you've seen on the, on the initial slide is you run a static analysis tool on the same on, on, on a piece of code, you use another tool and you get some other hundred results on the same piece of code. So then you are, you're, okay, am, am I secure now? Going back to Nikos' question, well, you never know because you run another new tool and you find out another hundred issues. Or you run the same tool next week and you have another hundred issues. Or next week after it gets updated and updated, sure. Right. Um, so, I think that's with you. Yeah, so basically, uh, what are we trying to do here? What, what do we want out of this, this process, right? Um, from, from a developer perspective, it's we don't want to worry about security. We don't want to have it in the back of our heads that we always have to do something extra about security. We want to automate as much as possible. I don't think someone wasn't very fond of me again. But anyway, we want to automate as much as possible, um, put everything in our uh, build pipeline so that I know I will push my code, it will run my tests, eventually some security stuff will happen, I don't know, magic. But then in the end, I would get a green box saying, OK, I can really push, push this to, to a release. Um, but then on the other hand, uh, we also have to be a bit more aware of the risks uh, that our application has, or the feature we're introducing uh, might uh, have some uh, new flows or something that, that we need to investigate further. And that's where, actually, uh, with the initiative of some like security champions in the company, um, it's something where we, it, the, the overlap between development and application security becomes more apparent because we have to work together, the developers, with application security to, to define some ground rules of what, what do we need to do, the, the minimum amount of things that we need to do so that we can achieve a certain uh, security level. Yeah, I'm just going to say uh, one thing that security champions is a, is a great idea. I know that there's a NOAS project uh, around security champions uh, led by a guy that now lives in Poland. I forgot his name. But, uh, yeah, but uh, it, it's a great idea. And especially in, uh, in bigger companies where you have over 50 scrum teams, it is impossible to do application security otherwise. Uh, you have to teach. Uh, developers security and you have to rely on a certain number of them to be security champions and um, I'll finish with that with with our in our experience having lead security champions so even you go even further because if you if you go for a security champion for each stunting then you end up with some 50 people how do you get those into one room to talk about security so lead security champions which you meet with on a regular basis, on a weekly basis in our case, and through them you take the world over to the other security champions and that goes even further to develop this test design. Yeah. Um, quick slide. So this topic, which is slightly right, lost a bit of fire. Um, so it just makes basically lots of people talk about this topic. Uh, for a long time I think I, I start, started hearing about this 2012. Uh, there were some OWASP events with some good talks, and the links are there. There is an OWASP pipeline project, which should 
definitely check. Uh, that's a, that's a, uh, an excerpt from, from, the, from the project showing kind of how, how the pipeline uh, evolves from, from, from the developer that writes the code uh, and getting into, into production eventually. Um, so, uh, and, and um, just to mention, I'll ask Effect Dojo, uh, a good tool, and uh, the next slide will explain basically what you could do with, what we do with a tool called Traffix, and what hopefully maybe this OWASP project will do at some point in the future. Yes. So this is the, this is a combination of as is and to be. Um, to keep things simple, uh, developers have their own Jenkins, basically, they have, they have their own CI. It can be Jenkins, it can be TFS, it can be Concourse, it can be any CI that they wish. The point is that that needs to interact with another CI which just runs, which just runs security tests. It doesn't do anything else, it's just used for, for running security tests. In this case, we've chosen Jenkins because it seems to have all the right plugins. It's a very powerful tool uh, in the universal world plugins it has available. Most of the tools you see listed there are supported uh, by Jenkins. Uh, I would say almost all of them. So maybe Security Monkey not yet. Uh, uh, the Node Security Project and maybe the Radio API not yet, I'm not sure. But uh, the, the rest of them are supported by, by Jenkins. So basically the principle is developers, the, develop, the developers have a pipeline. And that pipeline calls a <coughs> the security changes, so basically a, a testing pipeline if you wish. It runs these tests, sends results to a central location. In our case that's Threadfix, but it could be anything effect or maybe which is a it's more of kind of infrastructure focused uh, I found, but uh, nonetheless um, and that tool contains all the, the results from all of these tools. And uh, one good thing that it does it is it offers the option of applying a security policy on those results. So uh, you meet with your security champions, you meet with product, and you agree on a security policy for your product. You configure that in traffic, and then based on the results you get from all of these tools, and applying that policy, you will be passing the tests, and you could effectively move into production without anybody needing say yes, no, security blockers, gates, things like that. Um, so in a really fast sort of PTM uh, uh, organization, um, I, I found that this is this is becoming really necessary, not just uh, nice to have. And yes, then so the basically, more yes, yes, this is uh, basically this feature in reality. Uh, you can tell the solution, put the slides together because you just screenshot what the build is failing on my commit. Uh, but in any case, uh, we, we have basically uh, two environments, the dev environment and the QA environment as most, uh, most I don't know, pipeline uh, applications. Um, we have the build step, it deploys to the development environment, if the tests pass on time, uh, we promote it to QA. Uh, and then the, the interesting bit for this talk is the last two, two parts, right? So we have, as part of the pipeline, one job that basically triggers uh, the security Jenkins that uh, Lucian mentioned earlier, and that basically runs all the tools we have uh, that are connected to this project. Uh, it has fortified check marks, so whatever else um, is up and stuff. Um, but that's step one. Uh, step two that makes our life easier is the second step. That's basically uh, triggering a second job that basically uh, queries thread fix uh, to give the final result of all the tools. Uh, and that is basically en ends up with a success of or fail. And we know that if this post box is green, we can just put security sign off in this release because we know that all the tests and all the policies that we defined are passing. So, slightly more details on this thing. Yes. So, this one I'll, I'll probably go really fast. Um, <coughs> so, obviously you need... Uh, yeah, I think it's in the right order. So, you need Jenkins to run the tools. I only have one example there is to run a, an OWASP scan, OWASP uh, ZAP scan. 
so uh, a, a dynamic analysis scan. Um, obviously, as I mentioned earlier, um, Jenkins supports most of the tools that were displayed on the previous uh, slide. So we execute the scans, then in the second stage we uh, upload the results to Trefix. In the third stage we check the policy, so it's a simple get call to the, uh, to the traffic endpoint to ask for the result of the policy. And in the fourth and last step, we basically inform um, people about the results. So you see there the actual uh, result in, in the Slack um, saying that the first, uh, the first stage, which is running the tests, was successful. And then the second stage of checking the policy that was also successful, so the policy passed. So then developers would know within the pipeline, in the previous slide, basically the, the two uh, boxes would become green, or they would find out in the Slack. So whatever, whatever people prefer, they would be uh, notified if, if the tests were successful. Um, so with Netflix policies, it's, it's really simple. Uh, right now, the policies aren't very um, uh, complex. And they will become a bit more complex when we basically add a number of attributes which come out of threat modeling exercises. So to kind of link with the architecture discussion earlier, um, the, the threat modeling uh, sessions uh, will generate attributes. These attributes are, for example, is my application internet facing? Uh, is my application uh, processing PII, PCI data, or car data? So all of these will be attributes, and you can fail a policy in traffic based on these attributes and the criticality obviously of the vulnerabilities that are found. Um, so right on, on the screen I have a very simple policy. So one more strong and important thing in, in, well, in traffic, but I, I guess any, any other tool that uh, puts vulnerabilities together should be able to do is basically you if you know your application is not vulnerable to SQL injection, you just lack the stuff from the very beginning. So if, uh, for example, Fortify comes up with, for some reason, and it happens, some hundred vulnerabilities around SQL injection, uh, those would be immediately ignored. So you can, you can start building basically a profile for your application as time, as time goes. So um, I have more policies defined, but there is one single result, in this case, passing, and that's the call to the API, again, okay, simple call. And in Jenkins, basically, we search for uh, we search for passing equals true, uh, and if that's found for all the policies, then then we're happy. Yeah. So then uh, it comes back to us in the case where not everything is green and passing, right? Uh, that means that we, as developers, need to go back to our code and fix something, uh, and. Uh, that's another thing that uh, ThreadFix uh, helps us with uh, because it also helps us to, uh, it, 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 in the file report, it, it tells us exactly which file on which line has this vulnerability. And you can also use a plugin that they developed for IntelliJ if you're using something like that, even though uh, it, it, it has some, some bugs, hopefully they will be resolved soon. But in any case, you, you do receive a, a, a report with all the places in your application. They are highlighted with uh, a ThreadFix logo in, in every class where you have a vulnerability. And that makes it easier for the developer to actually go to the exact place where that vulnerability is introduced and try to do something about it. Really quick, just one minute. What tools do you use and how does how should your pipeline look like? It's really all about the appetite uh, of your business. Uh, obviously, some tools are very expensive. Um, so that gets me into the kind of the third, I think, in that list, which is if you don't have any budget, then go for free tools. And I really recommend, I don't know exactly what the pipeline's project is doing, um, at the last time in, uh, in, in real detail. But I wish they would be potentially working at a central repository for uh, results coming out of all the other free tools that are available. So like OWASP, for example. Um, Sony Cube, right? Um, so, uh, Sony Cube, sorry. So, um, 
Appetite is important. Uh, budget uh, is, is dictated by that. Uh, then again, with that budget, potentially you will get a team of DevSecOps. We discussed DevSecOps earlier. What is that? Well, I'm, 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 I'm looking at a team which basically develops and security tools and maintains uh, frameworks, security frameworks and pipelines. So they could potentially do that as well, apart from all the other things that they potentially could do. Um, somehow we should work with these commercial providers. Right now I see a mess of, of tools. Uh, if you want to go for check marks, expensive. Fortify, expensive. Vertical, expensive. You could go for one of them, but then you can only hope for the best because you don't know if that you know finds if that tool finds all of the parameters in your in your code. Obviously there's a peer review uh, and, and a manual code review that people can still do, but there is there time for that? Especially if there's again millions of lines of code or whatever. Is it time to look at all that? Plus, obviously you've done a code review today, but then maybe two weeks later there is an ex exploit available which you never knew of. And that can still be applied to the code that nobody's reviewing anymore because that's already old code. And finally, yeah, finally, uh, finally, the, the Security Champions Initiative. Uh, we believe it's very, very important that you inspire and also empower the Security Champions in your company. Uh, it can really make a big difference to introduce uh, security and bring it more to the left of the SDLC. Uh, if we develop with a security mindset and we start all working towards this uh, pipeline automation or anything like that, um, that's very, very important, very helpful and solves a lot of problems in the long run and makes life easier as well for the developers as well.